Well, welcome back to session two of Is There Life After Acts for Luke? Uh, in session one, hi, Gary. <laughs> yeah. in, in session one, we, we really picked up, uh, you know, where we left off in Is There Life After Acts for Paul, which was at the execution of, of Paul and Luke was there. And Starting to in this session, we're going backwards. Uh, in fact, we're going backwards probably uh, 40 years backwards. And that is to try to find out who's Luke. I mean, who is this guy? Because the way Luke writes not only the gospel and in Acts, he doesn't really tell much about himself. And really, there's only hints and uh, induendos around who Luke is. So to start out with, Gary, okay, who's Luke? <laughs> go ahead, who, who answer the Luke? question now that I said there's no scriptural basis for any of it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's sort of, yeah, sort I mean, there is. <laughs> but uh, Luke, uh, I guess you could start with Paul mm -hmm. and uh, Colossians, uh, chapter 4, verse 14, where he uh, mentions Luke. Uh, in the traditional translations, he calls him the beloved physician. Uh, you know, if I was uh, saying it today, I might say, oh, he's my favorite doc. <laughs> you know, uh, he's he's just the best. And uh, that, that was Luke, a dearly loved is another way to uh, translate that uh, doctor. And uh, that's the Luke that... Uh, most everybody begins to piece together other uh, other pu puzzle pieces, or I like to say it, connect the dots, because there's no place in the uh, scripture where they say, oh, here's a little sidebar character sketch of Luke, uh, so that you know uh, exactly who it is. So there's all this uh, presupposition, you know, uh, circumstantial evidence that you start to pull uh, together. And uh, so Paul's the place to start uh, with that beloved physician who is on his team. They're in Rome. Uh, they're in house arrest. When he mentions, hey, Luke says, hey, uh, Luke sends his greetings to uh, you in the church in Colossae. And uh, the, of course, there's the uh, accompanying epistle. There were two letters together with Colossians. Uh, there was Philemon. And he mentions Luke as being a fellow worker which uh, was one of Luke's terms to say, hey, this guy's uh, one of my uh, main team members. And, uh, you know, uh, he's giving his hellos to everybody there as well. So that's where I usually start. And then, you know, you can branch out. Well, I think, I think it's good to put uh, sort of a timeline together a little bit. So mm -hmm. what you're talking about with Colossians, Col the set of four epistles, Colossians, Philemon, um, uh, Ephesians. Ephesians, and Philippians, Philippians yeah. those were all written in around 62 AD, thereabouts, between 60 and 62 AD, uh, when Paul was in prison the first time. And... Right. and and you have to remember the the gospels weren't written yet uh, or were being written however you want to think of that so so what we read as luke's gospel and then the accompanying acts well that wasn't written yet so or was being written i think was you being and written. i for in our course with paul really yeah. from our studies decided it was happening uh, right then that the the Two, three years before that in Caesarea, the same house arrest that Paul's uh, under, uh, Luke had an opportunity to do some more interviewing and to, to uh, dig deeper into what was going on, as well as witness uh, these hearings that oh, yeah. were going on for Paul that would eventually send him to Rome and to house arrest in Rome. And so uh, it's in Rome, we think, uh, with that whatever period of time it was that Luke is writing Luke and Acts uh, as a two-volume uh, setup as to what the what what is Jesus about in the Jesus movement. 
One well, and uh, it just came to the top of my head. Uh, I have binge watched the the Chosen, <laughs> and ah. and uh, in the uh, the second season of the Chosen, they have John sitting there. They do a flash forward where Jesus is is basically uh, already crucified, and John's starting to uh, <laughs> to to write his gospel, uh, and and so he's just putting. He's just putting little uh, pieces of it together, not writing it, but writing the mm-hmm. stories and putting it in a, in a book, you know? Yeah. Oh, wow. And, cool. and, and interestingly enough, it happens after James is killed because it, it, it mm. strikes him. We've, we better write this stuff down before we're all killed. <laughs> so, mm. mm-hmm. so you got you to gotta love it. So, so you, you have a theory. <laughs> I'm going to blame your, I'm going to put the theory totally on your uh, doorstep. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) That it's, it's a twofold theory. Uh, And, and uh, the one is that each one of the writers of the gospels leave a little tell of who is writing the gospel. And reason being is we, we know it as the gospel of Matthew, you know, Luke and Mark and, and John, but in all honesty, none of them name themselves. Uh, you know, it's not like that's what the title was when when they wrote it. Um, and so, you talk about that. There's a tell in all four gospels about who the writer is of each one of those gospels, and you have an interesting theory about the tell uh, <laughs> that could be Luke's. So, with that, what? <laughs> And, well, and not just mine, because uh, uh, there are others. Uh, oh, no, no, I'm blaming who, it on you. Yeah, well, you, you can blame <laughs> it on me, but, but that's not right, dude. No, <laughs> I'll take I'll take the heat. Yeah, um, for, uh, you know, uh, the the gospel of Mark, there's this great little one line story about a guy uh, getting his clothing grabbed uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the guy, uh, you know, pops his head out of the the uh, the toga, and the toga ends up in the hands of the the uh, soldier. And there's a naked guy running, flashing, running away, and gets away. And that's usually um, remarked by Bible commentators as being John Mark. This young, it mentions a young man. And John Mark would have been a young man who lived in Jerusalem at the time, whose uh, household. Uh, was known uh, to be followers of this. And so uh, that's usually the tell, they say, of uh, John Mark. Uh, Mark saying, hey, that, that's how I was there. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it absolutely is one of my favorite biblical stories, uh, because if you don't find humor in the Bible, uh, oh, <laughs> you're going to have trouble all the way. Yeah. And then... Uh, um, then in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, there is a story of Matthew, the tax collector, which, uh, you know, Jesus goes to his, his tax collecting office and says, you come with me, you know, uh, I want you to follow me. And uh, then later that same evening, they're at Matthew's home, and there's this, a big drama about uh, Jesus hanging around with such uh, collaborators with the Roman uh, overlords. But then a little later in chapter 13, one of my favorites is uh, 1352, where he talks about the kingdom of uh, heaven is like a scribe who takes uh, stuff out of his collection or his his closet, uh, something old and something new. And uh, that's often uh, considered a tell uh, right in the middle of that gospel uh, where Matthew's sort of describing as a tax collector. He was a writer. He was a scribe. And uh, we often think of, of, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. That was a specific scribe in the biblical sense, but a scribe in the bigger uh, terminology of the day. It was somebody who just could write and wrote for a living. And wrote for you because you uh, hired them to write, whether numbers or letters. That another another side note and plug for the the chosen. 
the scene that they show Jesus uh, basically getting Matthew is exactly that, where he walks up and he says, follow me. And Matthew's sitting there and he's looking at his Roman guard and he's looking at Jesus. He's looking at his Roman guard, <laughs> shuts the book, <laughs> puts it down, walks in, turns around, locks his, locks his tax booth and walks away. And the Roman guard sitting there going, what are you doing? He goes, I quit. <laughs> and then Jesus says, it's going to be a great evening. Uh, we're going to have a, a great feast. And he's like, great. Where are we going? He's like, your house. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. And anyways, that's my plug. Another plug for it. But yeah, uh, no, I mean, they, they it's a great supposal of how would that situation play out if you were to dramatize it? And uh, that's great. Uh, and then uh, John's gospel, uh, there's several mentions of the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. And uh, then at, in the, at the last chapters of that uh, gospel, he says, hey, that's me. That's the writer of this gospel. Now, there's again, it doesn't say John uh, on the title page. There is no title page for those scrolls in the early days. There was a title, uh, a little title. Uh, sign that they attached to the outside of the scroll, but that long uh, disintegrated and fell off of all of them. But anyway, uh, John gives us his, uh, you know, and, and anything about John and James in that gospel uh, might help. But uh, to, to just call himself uh, not by his own name, but by that, uh, what'd you say, anonymous phrase, uh, the the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, it, it's a tell. So in, for Luke, we, we come to Luke's gospel and the two volumes, Luke and Acts, and uh, I believe, and uh, several other uh, people over the years have believed that it's uh, in uh, Acts 13, uh, chapter, uh, the beginning of that chapter has the story of Paul's call, uh, Paul and Barnabas being called in a small group. This small group, uh, it, he's been in uh, Antioch. They're at the church in Antioch where Barnabas uh, saw what was going on, was sent there from the Jerusalem church to see what was going on. They're talking to Gentiles and inviting them to church without going through the usual membership requirements. And uh, they sent Barnabas up there to see if what they were doing was all right. And Barnabas uh, liked it so much, he went and went looking for Paul. He went to Turkey, modern day Turkey now, of Tarsus. And Paul's, you know, uh, working away in his family business, no doubt, uh, as the tent making. And he says, Paul, you're coming with me. I just found something you are going to get excited about. And he goes and they're together. And these other guys, including someone named Lucius or Lucius, uh, if you depending on how you pronounce that C, uh, from Cyrene is there, and he's like uh, in the small group, and uh, they are praying uh, for uh, what's God got planned, what's next, and uh, there's also somebody in that small group uh, named uh, Simeon uh, Niger or uh, Simon the Black, and. Uh, is he the same Simon from Cyrene that was carrying Jesus's cross? Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. So there's lots of connections there, but Cyrene is modern day Libya. And that's where I believe uh, Luke tells us as Lucius or Lucius, uh, he tells us who he is. And yeah, you can see down at the uh, bottom of the, in the South there uh, of the Mediterranean is Cyrene. Uh, one of the most important uh, Hellenistic intellectual centers of the day, uh, and uh, also um, a, a, a fascinating place uh, near Alexander. If you go east, Alexandria, Egypt was considered the uh, one of the number one cities of the Mediterranean in the Roman days and in the Greek days, for that matter. And Cyrene was sort of like a a feeder for Alexandria. If you were going to make it big in Alexandria, uh, you had to go to Cyrene first often and do do what you did, and then they'd promote you to there. But uh, so we're talking about somebody who's uh, the deal was 
Alexandria, it, when the Greeks, after Alexander the Great Greek died, or Alexander the Great, excuse me, died, the, there was a, a family called the Ptolemies, and they were one of the uh, generals that uh, took over uh, for Alexander the Great. And they sent Jews from Alexandria to various places in the Mediterranean. And Cyrene was one of those places, and Crete was one of those places. Uh, Crete being right north of Cyrene. Uh, that's Cyprus. Yeah, there's Crete. And uh, uh, Crete and, and Cyrene actually uh, became one in the same province for the Romans later on when they set up their provincial government. Uh, the provincial capital was on Crete. But it, it also, because there was such a, uh, a cultural connection between Crete and Cyrene, uh, they, they had them in there together. And, and probably strategically, because you had to pass through those places if you were really hightailing it in the Mediterranean to get anywhere. And uh, they had the north and the south of it with those two places. But anyway, Luke from Cyrene. Uh, I can talk more about that if you want, or if you want, I'll stop for a moment and we can. Well, I, yeah, I was just going to put, put a little con, you know, geographical context, you know, like you said, Cyrene here, Alexandria here, Crete here. Um, here is Antioch of Syria up here and then Tarsus right there. So, so, um, interestingly enough, you know, Jerusalem is here. Boy, mm -hmm. it, if you're going to take the land route, guess where you're going through? Well, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and Alexandria is known to have had more Jews living in Alexandria than there were in all of the Judea, uh, Judean area at the time. And Antioch was probably second to Alexandria in having it, the Jewish population. Uh, Antioch, because of its place on the map and uh, its access to uh, other places like Damascus, some cats doing crazy things. Uh, it, uh, it was the crossroads. That was more of a metropolitan uh, place than many places because it was near Asia Minor. Yep. Uh, it was access to Persia and uh, to the east. And so uh, Antioch itself was fascinating, but it had a large Jewish population as well. So uh, that, that milieu that, uh, Paul Jewish, Jesus Jewish, all those first uh, Christians being Jewish. Uh, these were places where uh, it began, but didn't stop. And uh, that it became um, attractive to non-Jews uh, because of the ethics and the honesty and the, the amazing and, and, and the amazing personality of Jesus Christ. So we so we've got our ge geography context going, and again, um, you know your your th your theory or a theory. I'm not. I guess I won't call it your theory, but it's okay. <laughs> a, That's the one I like best. A, 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 and and it and honestly, it makes a lot of sense from the standpoint of if uh, he came from Cyrene, he's he's in Antioch of Syria, you know, and. You can certainly put all that uh, together. I mean, it it makes sense. Um, now, I think the tell's a little different, you know, and and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But I think the tell for Luke isn't in Acts, uh, you know, as much as it's in Luke, and and the very the very first uh, line of, from Luke is, is basically, hey, uh, I'm, I'm writing an account, you know, uh, for, you know, things accomplished among us. Right there. <laughs> he says, among us who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Huh. Could Luke, you know, the, it, you know. Uh, I guess we should start there a little bit uh, to uh, to unpack it a little bit is, you know, he's writing both the Gospel of Luke and Acts, which uh, most early people think of as a, as, as a single two volume set. Um, In fact, uh, each one is the standard uh, length of a scroll of the day. So it's like he he beautifully planned uh to uh do it in two volumes because you couldn't tell the whole story you could only tell 
the Jesus story in one on one scroll and get to the second scroll, you you've got the 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 followers of Jesus. And and he's writing it to a specific, at least I'm going to say a specific person. Although uh, the the name uh, means lover of God, so it, it it might not be a person per se. It could just be a, a people. But um, I've always been intrigued by uh, the uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins um, their theory, and I'll, it's just a theory that Luke was a slave. Uh, he was a slave from um, the Antioch, Syria uh, uh, area, and that um, he w- was sent away to be, become a doctor for this family that, that owned him uh, from a slavery standpoint. And that's where he met Paul, was at, at University of Tarsus, UT. Uh, UT. Probably not the Longhorns, uh, you know, <laughs> just, you know, from, from a Jewish standpoint, I don't think they're, well, it could be the Red Bulls. Who knows? I mean, could be Longhorn sheep. <laughs> it could be, could be. But that that's how he met uh, Paul was basically he, he was a slave that became a medical doctor through the patronage of, of his quote, quote, master and met Paul there. And then after a period of time of serving that family as, as their doctor, he became free. Um, very interesting you know, concept, because when we find Luke in the we sections, it seems like he's right around those port cities. Um, and, and that's his other tell, by the way, that uh, we, we mentioned together was the we sections where he's saying, hey, we went here, we went there. And uh, he's. He's on, he's on board with it, uh, literally and and figuratively. He's there, uh, but yeah, the 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 that that's where I've I've we talked before off off camera uh, that you know Jerry Jenkins uh, is still alive. Tim LaHaye is not, and and uh, I I get emails from Jerry Jenkins all the time trying to sell his writing uh, series. I I've always wanted to just email him and say, where did you get this idea from? Mm that Luke was a slave. And, and um, I guess we should talk a little bit about the idea of slavery in Mm -hmm. the Roman time, because you see it throughout the Bible, both Jesus and Paul talk about slavery and and not uh, slavery, not as this um, sort of American Civil War type slavery, but something that was just common through as part of life in that era. And and it was. I mean, slavery was just part of the culture. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about it? Because I, I know you, you've you got some uh, reading that you've done on slavery I, I, uh, in that time. And I also. So, but, but why don't you talk a little bit about what it meant to be a slave in that time period? Hmm. Yeah, there's a uh, Yale University prof, uh, Dale Martin, and he wrote a book uh, with with a burning question for himself. And that was, why would it be attractive for Paul to call himself a slave of Christ? Mm -hmm. Or often it's translated as servant so that it kind of downplays it. But uh, it was that same term used uh, uh, about slavery in the Roman Empire and and. The Greeks, uh, the Greeks uh, used it before that, and it, remember it's written in Greek. So uh, and so when as he researches and and talks about his research, uh, he, it's something that was very much like we might experience it or say uh, it, it, it's not exactly like it. It's somewhere in between the slavery we think of, where you are owned by somebody. But you're also, it was employment. It was one of the only ways to be uh, employed by somebody where you, your loyalty was, was theirs. Uh, they, they got you, they bought you. And, but you could work your way through uh, and to freedom, uh, almost a, what we know of as indentured servitude. And you would be freed at some point, called a free man or free woman, a freed person. And uh, you would be given Roman citizenship in the Roman system. So 
uh, you worked out to be way better off than uh, many people uh, that were never a slave. And uh, you all also often uh, were given uh, an education uh, by the person who owned you. So uh, Luke uh, and many other people were sent to the, the higher education places like Tarsus. Tarsus was, uh, in my reading, one of the, it was more of a localized place, but it was well known in that area as for its medical school, as well as for its other, it was a broad education. What was interesting about reading about doctors of the day is they didn't give you a doctor's diploma. Uh, you didn't have something to put up on the wall like doctors do of, you know, where they went to med school and all. But uh, it was part of the broader uh, education that you got in rhetoric or, uh, you know, speech making and writing, uh, in uh, uh, science, geography, uh, business. And so uh, when you got that education, but often they'd send you for specific something. And uh, then in, in return for sending you for that education, uh, they would have you come back and serve for a while. And uh, then with that promise of freedom uh, with honorable service. So uh, fascinating thing. And uh, by the way, Cyrene was considered the second best medical school in the Mediterranean at the time. And there was a medicine in Cyrene. There was a plant that grew only in Cyrene that in the century that Luke lived, uh, when the Romans took over, it was being used. Silphium is what it's called. And it was being exported. And eventually they exported it so much and could not reproduce it anywhere else in the world, uh, growing it from its seeds, that it became extinct. Uh, its value at the end of that century was as much as gold uh, because it, 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 it was so uh, wanted as an infection fighter, particularly. And what uh, they believe now is they look back, it probably, uh, you couldn't grow it from seed. It was growing from the roots as an asexual plant. It was a hybrid that happened naturally there. And when people, they, w they didn't know about that way of, ha of transplanting things at the time. So they were just trying to grow it from the seeds and it never worked. Mm. So uh, anyway, uh, this, the medical school in Cyrene was well known because of the healing uh, properties of that medicine that was available only for, it was like 125 miles by 35 mile plot of land where you could harvest this stuff. And uh, uh, they, it, uh, like I said, became extinct by the uh, end of that century. But uh, anyway, uh, the school system was amazing. And, and you just had to, uh, you came back with this, uh, hopefully a specialty. And writing was all a part of it, too. And so for Luke to be somebody who could also write the fantastic Greek and have the rhetorical skills that he evidently had to write what he wrote in Luke Acts and uh, and we believe, as we'll talk about later, uh, Hebrews, um, uh, would be in line with somebody who had an education uh, as a, somebody who was a physician uh, of the day. On that, whether, I, whether UT or uh, whether uh, yeah. Cyrene a &M. <laughs> There you go. Uh, you know, honestly, you know, both of, the, both of these things can be true. Meaning, mm -hmm. yeah. from from a scriptural standpoint, we know that you know Luke Luke is a trained uh, doctor. You know, so he got his training somewhere. We know from his writing that obviously he is, he has been well studied in the the rhetoric skills of the time and how to put together classical Greek writing because Luke's writing is is you know. Uh, top par uh, from from he chooses a, different styles. He he chooses at certain in mm -hmm. certain speeches. The opening of the Gospel of Luke uh, with uh, this high uh, Greek, and then in other places he's writing biblical Greek like it was in the Septuagint, and in other places he's just writing Koine, which is just everyday yeah. uh, street Greek. So it's fascinating to see how he can change gears within the books uh, to. Uh, uh, to adapt his writing to the situation. And I think one of the things that gets overlooked be, uh, is he had, it's hard to do research. And, and um, you know, 
whether we know that just from the writings, uh, he talked and interviewed a lot of people. Uh, you know, a lot of the disciples, a lot of the early followers, most likely, uh, you know, Mary, uh, Jesus's mother. So so he's able to do research, which is another trained method. You know, so so th- this is this is somebody that, uh, you know, we would call him a scholar academia type type person, but but also a feet on the ground type person, because uh, obviously he is an eyewitness, depending on how much of an eyewitness will, you know, we'll we'll see throughout this. But uh, uh, it's it's fascinating when it when it comes to to, you know, that aspect of Luke. Um I want to talk a little bit before we sort of move on to, to, uh, you know, what was Luke's background? Uh, You know, was he a Gentile? Was he a Jew? Was he a proselyte? Was he a God-fearing? Why would it have been important for Luke to have studied medicine at that time? Well... (laughs) <laughs> for uh, his own, if he was sent by someone as a slave, he'd be going back to either or both that person's uh, estate and home to be the personal physician for that uh, family. But he also was probably in a wider context, the physician for the business, uh, the agricultural uh, villa, uh, an estate, or it could be a uh, an enterprise uh, like oh, oh, shipping. Hold on a second. Hold on a yeah. second. There's not a Baylor White and Smith uh, around every corner. No, sir. No, <laughs> no, no doctor's office to go to. You were pretty much, you know, uh, the if you lived somewhere and stayed there, you might be uh, someone people knew uh, was he, uh, great in the healing arts. But you're right. There were no hospitals. In fact, hospitals didn't come until way into the A.D. centuries later. And uh, so that we're talking about uh, someone who had some kind of healing skills like Jesus. Uh, if If they knew he was in town, they'd either bring their sick to him or they'd go get him and bring him places. So, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, And if you were working for somebody else. Uh, you might have access only because of your association with that family or that uh, business. Crazy talk. Uh, now, one more added to that. Why would it be important for Paul? Well, uh, it, it, no. Paul might have, and a lot of writers write about this, uh, a lot of commentators and Bible scholars that have spent their life studying Paul, uh, if you remember, Paul's conversion has a blinding experience, yeah. and there's a physical manifestation uh, of stuff when an Ananias comes and, and heals Paul and uh, enables him to see uh, at the moment there's uh, some something's going on that it is described like things falling away from his eyes. Uh, it may not have been a full healing. It may have healed him enough to be able to see. But uh, he may also have had trouble later on uh, and, and being able to read, to be able to read small print. Uh, so that's why the scribes uh, in it was a common practice anyway. But remember, they didn't when you t- turn 40, you didn't have uh, readers uh, that uh, enabled you to be able to read. So you had to have somebody who could write. Uh, small and and read small because paper and writing material was so valuable in the day. Uh, and w- remember, there's letters like in uh, Galatians where Paul says, "Hey, see what big letters I'm using to write. This is me that's writing this uh, at this point." And so uh, for Paul, between not maybe not being able to see well because of an eye malady that carried him on could have been the same as the thorn in the flesh many of the people that write about that uh from galatians viewpoint also talk about the thorn in the flesh in a corinthians correspondence in second corinthians so uh, uh and then think about all that paul went through beatings and whippings and somebody had to attend to those wounds uh the jailer does in philippi 
uh, at first, but uh, Paul's physical health uh, literally took a beating uh, because of the way they uh, reacted to him. Uh, I've, uh, you know, it's you just think about when he catalogs that in Galatians, for instance, what he'd been through already, uh, having somebody on the team for all the people uh, on the team to be able to take care of uh, somebody uh, with a doctor uh, would be greatly helpful besides just the other incredible things. Uh, he, he was so beloved for what reasons? I mean, he must've been great at what he did and must've connected with people. Well, Luke did. And, uh, so there's other things involved there, but, uh, that, that's where as a doctor, uh, his talent would come in for Paul, keeping him alive to preach another day. I, w- I was going to say, you know, you, we, we, you always think about uh, when you really put it into context that every town Paul went to, he was kicked out and not kicked out nicely. Yeah. <laughs> and Luke wasn't part of that. Luke, Luke must have stepped back <laughs> as a support team and they were waiting to waiting to catch Paul when they threw him off the cliff. Well, it, uh, you just picture Luke, Luke is the Samaritan's purse of his day where, right. you know, the t- following the disaster, Paul, <laughs> following the disaster, <laughs> Paul, and, and, and there to give care. Uh, and, and I mean, you're absolutely right. Cause uh, you know, except for the military and the, 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 you know, the, the ruling class, if you want to call it, however you want to call them, you know, medicine and staying healthy was really, hey, good luck. You know, mm-hmm. um, that, that's up to you personally. There is no hospital. So. And there's an industrial part to that. Like we, I think we talked about uh, there's been a theory about Paul, uh, excuse me, about Luke being a physician on ships. Yes. Uh, uh, the ship's doc. Uh, because uh, all the maladies that happen both to the guys that are working on the ship, but also to the passengers that they take on all the time. And evidently, uh, the terminology he uses for uh, the shipwreck in chapter 27 of Luke is technical enough that they believe Luke had a great uh, uh, a great experience of shipping on the Mediterranean, and that could have been part of when he was became a freedman, uh, as he worked, uh, you know, if you're from Cyrene and you're find yourself in Antioch and we find him in, uh, Philippi and Troas and all kinds of places. Well, uh, he, you know, he's been around and uh, seems to know his way around. Yeah. I mean, uh, twofold on that, like you say, uh, some of his accounts of the shipping and, and uh, the, basically the story of them and their shipwreck is very nautical and uh, nautical mm-hmm. to the point of it could not have been written by somebody that didn't have, you know, that seagoing experience. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, yeah, uh, even with the, uh, I mentioned the, the Jesus Chronicles and, and LaHaye and Jenkins with the, the Luke story, yes. um, you know, they have him as a ship's doctor. Uh, ah, that, okay. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, basically, after he was freed, uh, he, as a slave, he became a ship's doctor, and that's how he made his living. And interestingly enough, that's how he, you know, comes upon Paul and Troas, so um, which big old port. Um, Connecting it to the uh, uh, to the Gospels and Acts, by the way, to Luke's presence of writing those, since there's no, hey, the, uh, I, Luke, wrote this, uh, there is a... Uh, uh, medical terminology throughout Luke and Acts that uh, I guess early on when somebody discovered that there was this terminology there, it was overplayed a little bit, but still uh, uh, Bible scholars today, uh, Craig Keener and uh, uh, Ben Wuthering, Witherington, a couple of the ones uh, I respect a lot, uh, do say even so, uh, there's enough of that uh, terminology there used by Luke that uh, his knowledge about medicine is still shows through and could be a, a tell as well, uh, but uh, a clue that he's laying there for you to see so much as just something he writes when he writes about situations where people are ill and and there's uh, healing involved or medical terminology that it's still uh, uh, something to take into consideration to uh, show that it was Paul, that beloved physician, that uh, wrote those. 
So let's uh, let's sort of take a step uh, away from you know profession and let's go a little bit to faith because mm-hmm. from Luke a Luke standpoint, um, there is basically four possibilities. Is he a Jew? Is he a Gentile? We think of those two big categories. But then we think of, is he a proselyte or is he a God-fearer? Um, and before we answer that, I'm going to put you on pause for a second because I think somebody's at the door. Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> so when we talk about Luke we're, and, we're, and who he is from a faith standpoint, four choices. He's either a Jew or Gentile, which is the one that we usually think about, or he is a proselyte or a God-fearing, which is basically sort of either leading to Jewish uh, faith or background. Because Luke has an amazing knowledge of the Jewish faith coming into Christianity, because you got to remember early, early Christians um, started out with Jewish, you know, and, until it really got to to the Gentiles. So, talk a little bit about, you know, what's the possibilities, and what do these terms mean? You know, proselyte, God fearing. We've we've talked about it before, but I think it's probably good to get a reminder of of, of that. So, sure. Uh, in, with the Jewish faith, uh, that was a hereditary mm-hmm. faith, uh, mostly. Uh, in that you were born into it in your family. And uh, I, the was that if your mother, the, the kind of the minimal one was if your mother was Jewish, you were Jewish. So, uh, you know, then uh, if both parents were great, if the father was, uh, you probably still had to, uh, you were considered it depending on the Jewish synagogue and folks that you hung out with if if they were real conservative well you probably had to do a little more to to become a, a jew uh if you were in more of a uh liberal uh if you want to call it that uh, or open hellenistic is what we would call it then a uh, group of uh jews then you that was fine with them but that would be the the Jewish part of it. You were born into it uh, because of your your parentage, your heritage, and uh, that Hellenistic Jew uh, part of it. Uh, kind of, some people think that's a false dichotomy because the Hellenistic, uh, the Greek uh, influence, uh, the Greco-Roman influence, and in the Mediterranean was felt by everybody. But there were those that, that were, you know, uh, there were Jews like in the revolt later on. We'll talk about the more like the Taliban of the Jews, where if you weren't one of them and you didn't dress like them and you didn't do it like them and you didn't believe like them and kind of be like you were Luddites, uh, then you weren't Jewish. And uh, there were those who believed that you could be a Roman citizen. You could uh, uh, participate in Western culture and still be a Jew. And that was more the case in the diaspora Jews who lived far and wide in the Mediterranean, but as well in Judea and Jerusalem particularly, there were those uh, in that that school of thought. So that Hellenistic Jew is more the, the open one that says uh, you can be Jewish and you can participate in the Western uh, culture, in the Roman culture. Uh, then if you were not born Jewish, uh, there were a couple categories of being able to uh, come into the Jewish faith. And we're talking about this, by the way, even though we're talking about Christianity is our basis. Remember, the first Christians were uh, in that uh, Jewish denomination, if you will, called the way uh, or the Messiah's uh, people, the Christians. And so they they were Jewish uh, by and large uh, from the beginning. And Paul. And Peter and Jesus and everybody else that got chosen as the 12 apostles, for instance, were Jewish. And uh, so uh, how did they interact with centurions and how did they interact with non-Jews and and how did somebody become a Christian? That was the big deal in the first generation of Christianity. And Acts leads up to that into Acts 15 
as far back as Acts 9 and 10, where uh, Peter is interacting with Cornelius in, in Caesarea. There's a whole a quarter of, almost a quarter of, uh, well, almost the rest of Acts uh, yeah. is that interaction of deciding what do you do with people that weren't born Jewish? What do you do with Gentiles? the goy <laughs> or goyim <laughs> out there and do they have to be do the full conversion that jews do or is there something if they believe with their mouth and with their heart are are they part of uh, the messiah's movement and they don't have to go through the rituals and the the steps of being a jewish convert so that's the difference like a full proselyte like you're saying that you had to go through this whole membership uh process it took a long time it took some physical surgery and it's uh, for the men at least and uh it was a uh, and you you became kosher you followed a particular diet uh, all the torah of the jewish faith and then uh the god fearers were a sort of like associate membership in a sense that uh you didn't have to do all the the um uh, the rituals and all the the membership steps, but you could uh, participate in the life of the synagogue in the sense that you could sit in the uh, area outside and literally sometimes outside the synagogue where you could still hear what was going on inside, uh, or you could you could just uh, be a, a, a benefactor. I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, you could pay. Uh, your pledge. Uh, there's a centurion in uh, Capernaum who actually builds the synagogue for them, uh, who's a God fearer. And there's a terminology that Luke uses uh, in his uh, in Acts, particularly, but Luke and Acts, where there are uh, these God fearers who uh, are the people who they really join, uh, in a sense, the Jewish faith but not with the full uh, membership. And so uh, that's my way to explain it. And you probably have other ways that. No, I think that's right. good. Uh, the, the one thing, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm setting a breadcrumb here for our next session. So, yeah. so I'm not going to go all the way, but I'm going to drop a little breadcrumb on the way. Um, Jesus's earliest followers would they have been sort of the mixed multitude of Gentiles, Jews, proselytes, and God-fearers? Or would they have been on the Jewish line, which is basically taking the Gentile out of that, and just one of the three over here, uh, you know, Jew, proselyte, or god What What, what do well, you I'm think? I'm to hear your read of it, but my read of it, uh, and the way Jesus even reacts to like the Syrophoenician woman who comes, who's she's not Jewish, and she comes for her Gentile daughter to be healed. He says, uh, "No, ma'am, sorry, I'm here for the the Jews, not for for all." And I, we, we can leave that for another session to talk about, you know, where he he considered her a dog, which was a big <laughs> insult in the day, where he kind of uh, says that, you know, that's uh, you know that that's not cool. Uh, that I'm not here for you. I'm here for these people now. But but he interacts and he goes ahead and she shows such faith yeah. in her persistence for her uh, daughter that he he heals her. Yeah. And uh, it happens over and over again with the the Capernaum uh, or and other centurions. Yeah. Uh, so by and large, he was there, and those twelve apostles are all Jews now. Within again the Jewish denominations, they may have been like they were from Galilee, and the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea thought the Galileans were a bunch of hicks that were interacting with uh, Gentiles too much because they tried to keep it, their businesses to themselves, their daily interactions. You could become unclean if you inter if you went into the home of a Gentile. So, uh, yeah, there was a lot going on there. Uh, if you were to look at all the stories just through those eyes of Jewish, Gentile, and how strict a Jew were you, uh, uh, strict, uh, or, you know, it, it becomes uh, quite fascinating to see. 
but uh, the or at least at the beginning, the people he was gathering around him were sort of, uh, you know, he had a little bit of everybody. He had uh, a variety of people that were there, and it's that's what's fascinating about it. From a tax collector like Matthew, who's uh, a, a Jew but a, a traitor in the eyes of the real hardcore Taliban Jews, yeah. and uh, and yet uh, he's got other people like zealots who they're like the Taliban Jews on his team. So he picks this, this variety that really represents a, an incredible uh, what, diversity. Well, what I, what I'm, what I'm hearing is I think we both agree from this standpoint that the primary mission of Jesus was to the Jewish sect let's just call it sect that could be jews proselyte jews or god-fearing jews right. while he interacted with gentiles and he healed gentiles uh it wasn't the time of the message to go to the gentiles yet and, correct and hence the term messiah which was a very jewish yeah uh rescue uh operation for a, a jewish leader to rescue the jewish people so so why do I drop that breadcrumb? Why do we why do we drop that breadcrumb? Why? Why, Chris? You tell me. <laughs> well, we're trying to figure out who this Luke guy is. We know he's a doctor. We know that he is highly educated. Uh, we know that he has at least a working background of uh, the Jewish culture, along with the Gentile culture. OK, so he, he's he's sort of, uh, you know, got got a little mixed of all of that. But he somehow knows about, like I said, the Jewish culture deeply. And yeah. why why does that matter? Mm, mm. Uh, it, it, <laughs> big deal, because for all of this, uh, Paul, uh, who he becomes a team member for the only reason we're talking about Luke in in many ways, reasons is he became a team member on Paul's mission from Judaism to the Gentiles and in Luke thir in Acts 13 when what Antioch decides to do <clears throat> is to send this these two guys Barnabas and Saul out and do what they were doing locally preaching about Jesus as the savior of the world to Gentiles, now they were sending him out on the road yep. uh, into the Mediterranean culture and uh, to places to say that same thing, both to Jew first and to Gentile. And that's those Paul's words, uh, sent to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And then he becomes known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Yep. And this whole story, Luke's gospel starts in Jerusalem, uh, after he does his introduction, like you said to Theophilus, we're at the temple in Jerusalem, and it's Zechariah, one of the priests, performing. And a lot of people like start there, and they're going, "Whoa, whoa what are we doing here? This this seems like uh, weird." But uh, uh, it's a, that's where he starts, and he's going to take us back to Jerusalem uh, uh, with Jesus's life. We're going to be back in Jerusalem with the uh, Pentecost, another Jewish festival, annual holiday that uh, they celebrated. And that's going to be a big deal. And then he's going to have us back. Well, where are we going to be? We're going to end up in Rome from the Jew Jewish capital in Jerusalem to Rome and their capital. And all through Jerusalem, where Paul gets arrested at the temple at another holiday celebration. Uh, and uh, then starts this final journey that's going to take him to Rome, uh, at least in the book of Acts. So uh, where, what is Luke? In this broad spectrum of people, uh, all kinds of people, uh, like Mark Strauss, he teaches in Southern California. Hi, I highly respect Mark's work. He believes Luke was just a Gentile who, who got Jesus. And uh, though he's open to other interpretations, uh, that's his where he falls in it. Uh, Gregory Sterling, he's a Yale University divinity uh, dean. Uh, he believes he was a God-fearer. He was a Gentile that uh, was in that 
uh, you know, in between membership that didn't go all the way, but he, he was worshiping with Jews and got into it and, and uh, researched it and was a, a leader in the Jewish faith before he became a Christian and accepted Messiah. Uh, uh, e. Earl Ellis, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary guy, I think of the late, uh, could be, though I might have him uh, prematurely, uh, uh, you know, uh, deceased. Uh, he believed he was a Hellenistic Jew. He was a Jew, but he was of the Roman culture, and uh, that he, uh, ex you know, experienced that wider world and wasn't one of those uh, strict uh, uh, Pharisaical Jews as uh, that uh, were so uh, against even associating with with uh, non-Jews. And I discovered one just last night again in reading uh, a, a footnote that somebody had in a in a in their article about Luke that I I followed up on and found uh, there's a, a professor at Queensland University in Australia who believes that he is of the priestly family, that Luke was not only a Jew and could have been a Hellenistic Jew uh, uh, at the same time, but his, that his lineage linked him to the priesthood. And he takes all of Luke's treatment of Jerusalem and the priests uh, in the, the book and uh, in the two books, the two volumes and Hebrews uh, I mean, it took some uh, great knowledge for Jesus to be the high priest and to write that book. That That's sometimes more confusing. Uh, the book of Hebrews is more confusing to people than the book of Revelation, because you have to know about the Jewish priesthood uh, to know what uh, is going on in that book. But uh, Luke could be the person uh, who. So that, that's one I, I'm going to follow up on a little more and, and read about. So. Uh, great minds and very faithful Christians have all kinds of opinions of having been places. And no matter what it was, glory to God, he came to Jesus and realized he was the savior of the world. And uh, all his education, his background, his smarts, his belovedness, he used it all in very self-effacing ways where he didn't call attention to himself. He called attention to Jesus and to those who were lifting Jesus up. So uh, great admiration for somebody who's got the right stuff uh, in so many ways and used it uh, not for his own glory, but uh, for us to have to piece it together like detectives to discover who this person was uh, through the writings uh, and uh, to come to a point where we realize it's all for Jesus. So I'm going to ask one last question which I don't want you to answer. <laughs> so we know, I'll make a statement first. We know that Paul was probably in Jerusalem when Jesus was in Jerusalem. Whether Paul saw Jesus, uh, uh, knew about Jesus, we know that shortly after he's there when Stephen is stoned. So we, Paul's there during all this. I wonder. Was, did Luke, could Luke have been there also? Could Luke have been a follower of Jesus? Mm. Wow. Uh, at first glance, it seems uh, improbable, but we should probably read a little about it and maybe uh, come back next week and talk about that. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> so if that doesn't get you to come back, I don't know what will, uh, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, I wonder if Luke was a follower of Jesus. Well, uh, that, that sort of gets us uh, a little bit deeper into who Luke was. Amen. Uh, and hey, maybe preparation for next week. Everybody should walk backwards, like for about a hundred steps, just to <laughs> see what it's like to walk backwards a little bit. <laughs> Well, maybe not a hundred steps, maybe just yeah. seventy. Yeah, beware, <laughs> beware of where you are. <laughs> it's just, they just have to walk back seventy steps. Yeah. So. and you can look behind you. You don't have to uh, <laughs> do it without looking. No, yeah, I like seventy. <laughs> well, you never, you never know who you're gonna come up to on the road to Emmaus. So, anyways, <laughs> with that, would you like to end us with prayer? Sure.
uh, well, and if you feel led, I, I would always yield to you, Chris. So no, that, that's okay. I, I respect my elders. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, glor- glory to you, Lord. Uh, we pray uh, maybe words that uh, Paul uh, might have prayed, or we pray uh, other scripture from the Psalms and. There's uh, prayers in Luke's gospel right at the very beginning of the gospel in those first two chapters uh, that are are wonderful praise prayers. Uh, You know, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Uh, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He has come to his people. He has set them free. He's raised up a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Or... Lord, let your servant depart in peace. My eyes have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. There's just some fantastic praise prayers there in the the prayer of the angels. Glory to God in the highest. Peace to your people on earth. We just thank you, Lord, for Luke passing to us some fantastic words of prayer. Prayers uh, prayed uh, of praise and just glorying in your story where you've come to save us and rescue us. Uh, No matter who we are, where we're from, what our background is, what our education is, uh, the stories that Luke told showed people from all backgrounds and all places coming to know you. And so we ask you to use us in that same way, uh, to use us to bring people from all walks of life and all backgrounds and places to know you so that they might know you as their Lord and Savior, Messiah, Jesus Christ. We pray this and ask you to use us in your name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, may the Lord be with you. Thank you.